Hello again, this is Robert Whittaker with the latest podcast and this one is in fact on the heart. As I'd written an article in that splendid journal Medicine, I asked Elsevier Limited whether we could have permission to use some of the material in this podcast and they very kindly agreed. Now the heart is a midline valvular muscular pump which is cone shaped at about the size of a fist. It weighs about 300 grams in an adult and it lies in the middle mediastinum of the thorax as we described in the last podcast. It has an inferior or diaphragmatic surface that sits on the central tendon of the diaphragm. It has a base which faces immediately posterior and lies immediately anterior to the esophagus and the descending aorta in the posterior mediastinum. The base is mostly the left atrium but with a small amount of the right atrium as well. The left surface of the heart is the left ventricle and the right surface is the right atrium and each in turn is related laterally to the respective phrenic nerve and lung. The anterior surface of the heart lies behind the sternum and the costal cartilages. Now what constitutes the anterior an inferior surface of the heart is largely dictated by the position of the interventricular septum. This septum bulges to the left as the left ventricular wall is much thicker about a centimetre than the right ventricular wall which is nearer three to five millimetres. The septum also lies somewhat obliquely across the heart almost in the coronal plane so that the anterior surface of the heart is about two-thirds right ventricle and one-third left ventricle whereas on the inferior or diaphragmatic surface of the heart these proportions are reversed so there's two-thirds left ventricle and one-third right ventricle. Now the actual muscle of the four chambers of the heart and the four valves are all attached to and supported by a figure of eight shaped fibrous skeleton This consists of a central fibrous body and there are extensions called fila coronia and these surround the valves. This skeleton actually divides and electrically separates the atria from the ventricles. It's a remnant of the atrioventricular cushions that form during the fetal development and from it extending downwards is the thinner membranous part of the interventricular septum. Let's now look at the pericardium which holds and protects the heart but also provides enough potential space for filling and emptying of the chambers. The outer layer of the pericardium is the tough fibrous pericardium which blends with the adventition of the aorta, the pulmonary trunk and the superior vena cava above and the central tendon of the diaphragm below. Within this fibrous pericardium there are two further layers of serous pericardium a visceral layer lining the actual heart itself and a parietal layer which lines the inner surface of the fibrous pericardium. These two layers of serous pericardium are continuous with each other as they reflect off the major vessels behind and also above the heart. Where they reflect between the pulmonary veins on the posterior surface or the base of the heart, the fold of pericardium is called the oblique sinus of the heart. This is not to be confused with the plane between the superior vena cava and the pulmonary veins posteriorly and the aorta and pulmonary trunk anteriorly. This is made by the folding of the heart and is termed the transverse sinus of the heart. Let's now look at the features of the various chambers. First let's look into the right atrium. We can see the inferior vena cava passing through the diaphragm at the level of T8 and immediately entering this chamber. There is no true valve at this level. However, in the fetus there is tissue which is termed a valve. It's called the valve of the inferior vena cava. But it isn't a real valve and it just simply guides the blood coming back in the fetus into the right atrium and makes it pass through the foramen ovale. The superior vena cava enters the superior aspect of the right atrium. The fossa ovalis, which is the remnant of the septum primum, and with its overhanging limbus, which is a remnant of the septum secundum, 
They lie on the smooth interatrial part of the chamber, which it itself has actually developed from the sinus venosus. This smooth area that arose from the sinus venosus is separated from the muscular part with its musculi pectinati by the crista terminalis internally and the sulcus terminalis externally. These musculi pectinati are limited to the auricle and the auricle itself arose originally from the fetal atrium. Now lying in the right atrium between the opening of the inferior vena cava and the atrioventricular orifice is the opening of the coronary sinus. This again is protected by a small valve that prevents regurgitation into the coronary sinus during the atrial contraction. Between this orifice and the septal cusp of the tricuspid valve is the AV node or the atrioventricular node. Now let's turn our attention to the right ventricle. The blood enters this chamber via the tricuspid valve from the right atrium. The valve has an anterior, a septal and a posterior cusp. It's worth noting that the posterior cusp actually lies inferiorly and to each of these cusps is attached a papillary muscle by a fibrous cordi tendinii. The wall of the right ventricle is normally about 3 to 5 millimetres thick and it's raised internally by a mass of interweaving strands of muscle which are called the trabeculi carnii. Fairly low down on the anterior septal wall some of this muscle joins the anterior papillary muscle and is called the septomarginal trabecular or moderator band. It carries part of the right bundle branch of connecting tissue and helps to speed up the contraction of the right ventricle to match that on the left side. Now blood leaves the right ventricle upwards through the smooth conus arteriosus or often called the infundibulum passes it through the pulmonary valve with its two anterior and one posterior cusps. A useful way of remembering this is by the word papa, P-A-P-A, -A, which means pulmonary, anterior, posterior, anterior. Just a way of remembering the names of the cusps of the pulmonary valve. Now let's turn our attention to the left atrium. This is a rather box-shaped chamber lying at the base of the heart and receiving its blood from the lungs via the four large valveless pulmonary veins into the four quadrants of the chamber. As with the right atrium, it has both a smooth and a muscular part. The muscular part is called the left auricle and the muscle within it is the musculi pectinati and once again this was the original fetal atrium. Blood passes from the left atrium into the left ventricle via the mitral valve with its rather larger anterior and smaller posterior cusp. Each again is supported by cordi tendinii and papillary muscle. The wall of the left ventricle is much thicker than the right and is about a centimetre thick and again is roughened by the trabeculi carnii as we saw in the right ventricle. The smooth outflow tract is the aortic vestibule and it corresponds to the membranous part of the interventricular septum. The blood flows up into the aortic valve with its two posterior and one anterior cusps. Again this could be remembered by the word APAP, -A -P, a pap and that stands for aortic with its posterior, anterior and posterior cusps. It should be noted here that the ostium of the right coronary artery arises in the anterior sinus, whereas the left coronary artery arises in the left posterior sinus. The purpose of the trabeculated pattern within both the atria and the ventricles is to provide an efficient way of gaining power without excessive thickening of the wall of the chamber. And again it's worth noting 
that a single papillary muscle has separate cordy tendineae to two adjacent valvular cusps so that it not only closes the valve but pulls the cusps together. It not only draws them together but it prevents valvular eversion during systole. Now let's look at the conducting system of the heart. There is specialised cardiac muscle which forms the sinuatrial node or the SA node which lies in the right atrial wall between the opening of the superior vena cava and the auricle. The AV node, which we described previously as lying in the medial wall of the right atrium, the tissue of which descends into the interventricular septum. The contractions originate in the SA node, which we call the pacemaker, and spread through the atrial walls to reach the AV node and from there down into the left and right bundles. These plexuses of kunji fibres allow spread of excitation down into the ventricular walls. There's further autonomic control of these uh, nodes via the cardiac branches from both the sympathetic ganglia in the cervical region and also in the thoracic ganglia from T1 to T5. There's also, of course, parasympathetic fibres for slowing the heart and these arrive from the superior and inferior cardiac branches from the vagus and from the recurrent laryngeal nerves. All these autonomic nerves pass via the superficial and the deep cardiac plexuses on the lateral and medial aspects of the aortic arch. Now we've described the blood supply of the heart briefly in the sense that we said that the ostia of the coronary arteries arise in the aortic sinuses above the attachment of the base of the relevant cusp. The right from the right anterior sinus and the left from the left posterior sinus. From its origin the right coronary artery passes anteriorly between the right atrial appendage and the pulmonary trunk to enter initially the right anterior atrioventricular groove and then it runs round the side of the heart into the right posterior atrioventricular groove where it anastomoses with the terminal branches of the circumflex artery from the left coronary artery. As it reaches the posterior interventricular groove on the inferior surface of the heart and in 90% of people it gives off the posterior interventricular branch. This anastomoses with the terminal branches of the anterior interventricular artery, of course from the left coronary artery, in this groove. The important branches of the right coronary artery that we need to note is a branch which goes to the left atrium, to the right conus and to the sinoatrial node in 60% of people. There's also a right atrial branch, a right marginal branch and then as we've said already that in 90% of people it also supplies the posterior intraventricular branch. This in turn supplies the ventricles and also branches into the septum. In 90% of people the right coronary artery also supplies the AV node. Now let's turn to the left coronary artery. This ostium of the left coronary artery is arising in the left posterior sinus and then passes anteriorly between the left atrial appendage and the pulmonary trunk to lie in the left anterior atrioventricular groove. It almost immediately here divides into the anterior interventricular artery and the circumflex artery. The anterior interventricular artery which is often referred clinically as the anterior descending artery passes down in the interventricular groove around the apex of the heart and anastomoses with the terminal branches of the posterior interventricular artery. Whereas the circumflex artery continues first in the anterior and then in the posterior atrioventricular grooves. As we said before it anastomoses with the terminal branches of the right coronary artery. The important branches of the left coronary artery are the branch to the sinoatrial node in 40% of people and then from the circumflex artery we have the left marginal artery 
an artery to the left conus, and then the posterior interventricular artery in only 10% of people. And similarly, the atrioventricular node is also supplied by this left coronary artery in 10% of people. Arising from the anterior interventricular artery are the diagonal artery and ventricular and septal branches. So therefore we can see that in 10% of people the majority of both ventricles and the septum are supplied by the left coronary artery alone and these people are said to have left cardiac dominance. We could also make the general comment that there is unfortunately rather poor collateral communication between the left and the right coronary systems.